Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd ask you to turn to 1 Peter, as I mentioned. I'm going to be taking a look at just the first part, an introduction to a letter that has sort of a lot surrounding it. And there's some things that we can pull from that. I know last week Matt preached a bit of a Thanksgiving service. Um, I'm also going to preach a Thanksgiving service. We're just coming out of the Thanksgiving holiday, so hopefully it doesn't feel like a double up on that, but I think there's enough there that we can certainly be thankful for. Think about what are you most thankful for on Thanksgiving Day? The gathering of family, the changing of the season, a look forward to Christmas. A family, a family Thanksgiving, it holds all kinds of traditions. And you might think about some of those traditions in your home. We have a lot of traditions that we have as a part of our Thanksgiving meal. Of course, there's turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes, gravy, all that good stuff. There's baked corn and cranberry sauce. There's one thing that if we don't have it, it's not Thanksgiving. You know what that is? Pie. I saw a couple people say it. Somebody else had something else in mind. For my family, it's pie. Not only pie. Homemade pumpkin pie. Yeah, I got an amen. That's good. We're on, a, we're on a good path here this morning. You know that Pennsylvania is made forever famous in the song, There's No Place Like Home for the Holidays? Because he met a guy in Tennessee, right? And he's, he says he's heading for Pennsylvania and some homemade pumpkin pie. So I think that's pretty much what we're known for. Pennsylvania and homemade pumpkin pie. There's another pie that's usually alongside our pumpkin pie because it's a table of plenty. And there's a fresh baked apple pie there as well. So you get to the end of your meal and you have this dilemma. It's a major dilemma. So most people just take both and you're okay. But this, this year we actually, we brought it to a poll because the question came up, if you could only have one, if someone decided we'd only make one pie, which pie would have to go? And we came to a resounding conclusion. There was no recount. The apple pie would go. You have to have homemade pumpkin pie. It is not Thanksgiving without homemade pumpkin pie. So as we're reading this morning, I know I can make light of that, and I can probably talk about pie for the remainder of our time. I'm not going to do that. I do make light of it. But I just want you to think about, you know, what is it that you cannot have Thanksgiving without? Think of that. Think of that as we're reading this passage, and I think it'll be brought to you pretty clearly as we, as we move on from there. I'm going to pick up in verse 3. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief, in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing them, was pointing when he predicted the sufferings Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, when they spoke of the things that they have now been told, you by those that have preached the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, 
Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just add your blessing to the reading and the hearing of this word. God, this morning, this message is perhaps not a new one, but Lord, it is the beginning of our hope. It is the end of our hope. Today, would you help us to consider more deeply living in the hope of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't even think I have to say spoiler alert. It's not much of a surprise this morning. It picks up in the very first part that we read. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into the living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the source of our genuine hope. That is the source of our genuine thanksgiving. We can live without the pumpkin pie. We don't live without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is the source and the genuine hope of our salvation. It's sort of the punchline of my sermon today. I'm not saving it for the end because it needs to be brought up at the beginning. Do you remember what Matt preached about last Sunday? He took us to Psalm 75 and he told us that we had a purpose as man. The purpose of man is what? To praise the Lord. Exactly right. Praise the Lord. Our purpose is to praise the Lord. And as followers and believers in Jesus, that is solely rooted in the salvation message. What Christ has done. His resurrection. The grace that he has given us to understand that. To put our faith in that. To trust that. That has everything to do with genuine thanksgiving. And I'm just going to turn now this morning. Don't know this, you know. For the unbeliever, it doesn't matter what is said from a pulpit. Words of encouragement. We could perhaps give advice. For the believer, sometimes we do. You know, we're teaching, and all of these things can be used in our Christian walks. But make no, make no mistake, if it's not rooted in our faith in Jesus Christ, if it doesn't start in that place, all of these other things, they don't matter. They don't matter. Whatever that is for you at your, at your Thanksgiving table, it's, it's not on the table. You can't hold the Thanksgiving festival because the purpose of our Thanksgiving, the root of our Thanksgiving, is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's his resurrection from the dead. So moving forward in our, in our passage this morning, 
I want you to think about that. I want you to just keep that right, right at the front of your thought because we're going to return to it again. But I think what Peter does here is he's giving this as a word of encouragement. And so often many of the letters start this way. Paul is very similar. I don't know if you're familiar with those letters. But Paul writes nearly the same way. Paul says in Ephesians, Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the spiritual realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Many, many of the letters are opened this way. Rooted in our praise to God that is rooted in our faith in Christ. And I think about, I don't know, there's that old saying, preaching to the choir, that if you're a believer here this morning, you're like, yeah, we get it. Absolutely, that's what our hope is. Yes, that's where our thanksgiving is. But do we live like that? Are we living like that? Are we, are, do our words, Matt said this a lot of times, are our words lining up with our faith by what we do? It's an important question to ask yourself. But I think also Peter moves on and he starts to give some reasons why you might not be living in that type of a hope. Or you might not be living in that type of a genuine thanksgiving, consistently recalling what Christ has done. Living your life knowing what is to come. And the first clue to it is found in verse 6. Look back with me. Chapter 1, verse 6, he says, In this we greatly rejoice, referring to Christ. And then he says, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Did you catch that in verse 6? That you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. For the mature believer, you know that that is a real thing. That in this world, we will have trouble. We will have difficulty. We will have things that we need to grieve through. Reminds me of a story. Back in 2010, we lost my grandmother to brain cancer. It was a difficult time for our family. It was a bit unexpected. She was the youngest of my grandparents and the first to go. We're kind of working through that as a family and grieving through that. My son at the time was two years old. And I distinctly remember a conversation about grandma, talking about the things that had taken past. And Luke looked up at Nicole and I and he said, when we all get to heaven in a little while, will we see grandma there? What's so profound about his statement was that in a little while, it just struck me. Two years old, going to be in heaven in a little while. And I think about that, you know, what, what Peter is encouraging his readers is, if you're suffering trials and grief and difficulty, the situation is temporary. The older you get, the more you realize how quickly our time on earth goes. Am I right? I hear people say this all the time. Each year goes faster. And there's like that surprise. It's Thanksgiving again? It's going to be Christmas? What happened to 2021, right? As the years go by, it just happens so quick. All my grandparents have passed over the course of the last decade. But it's interesting because now... That just seems like a season, you know? Yes, Grandma went first, and we grieved that. We grieved our loss. But we didn't grieve as the unbeliever grieves, right? We didn't grieve as if there was no hope. And you can kind of step back from that and have a perspective on what Christ has done for us. It changes your outlook. It changes your understanding of that hope. And I, I know that that can be probably a difficult word because if you're in the midst of your suffering, if you're in the midst of your trial, 
just talking about this this morning. You know, it's difficult when somebody comes up and just says, hey, you'll get through this. It'll be okay. It's almost over. Because for you, it may not feel like that. It might not feel like a temporary situation. But the reality is your situation is temporary. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a hope that transcends all of this, way beyond. Peter doesn't stop there. He also encourages the reader to know that if you're experiencing the trial and the suffering, this is the testing of your faith. It comes so that your faith may be proved genuine. And did you see what the result of a genuine faith is? Praise. Praise. It turns us right back to praise. We're coming right back to speaking of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because our faith has stood strong, even in the midst of difficulty, even in the midst of our struggle. Genuine faith, a faith that is real. Real homemade pumpkin pie is difficult to make. I've never seen the whole process, but I've definitely seen part of the process. In my family, my mom will typically take one of those long neck pumpkins. I'm speaking beyond what I understand. I could invite someone up here. I could have someone come up and they could explain how this is done. I know this needs skin down and cooked down and it needs pureed, right? I do know at the end of the day, you end up with a pumpkin custard that is not Libby's in the can. You understand? That is not authentic. You can buy Libby's in the can off the shelf, right? It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. But I've had some pretty good Libby can pumpkin pies. Really, I have. Not bad. Not bad. In fact, have you ever thought about a taste test? You put the homemade pumpkin pie next to the canned pumpkin pie. Could you tell the difference? You know, we say confidently, oh, yeah, I could tell the difference. But that canned pumpkin pie was just the right spices and the right technique and the right, right, either side by side. You know who can tell the difference? The one who made them, right? The one who made them, they know. Which one is authentic? Which one is real? When we're going through trials and difficulty, if you're going through a, a, a season of grieving or, or one of those things, understand this. Number one, it is temporary. Number two, it's revealing your genuine faith, which in turn leads us to praise God, right? It helps us to think back. What did Christ do? He was resurrected from the dead. And we live in that same hope of the resurrection. That's an amazing thing. And that's, that's how we should be living our lives as Christians. I read, this is great, research for a sermon, that Libby's canned pumpkin lasts on the, on the shelf for around 740 some days. Right? That's a long time. It lasts like that. If you open the can, one to two days refrigerated. Right? It's no longer fresh. It becomes perishable. It becomes perishable. And that's the second thought I want to place to you this morning, thinking about this idea of perishable. Peter writes that faith is of greater worth than gold. Look down at verse 17. He says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. If you're familiar with uh, the epistles here, if you're familiar with these, these two books and the way that Peter writes, during this time, there must have been a real difficulty and struggle between the rich and the poor. You can see that theme throughout. And, and you can kind of see it show up here a little bit. You know, 
what have we put our hope in? Is it the perishable or is the imperishable? Another way to say that is, what have you put your hope in? It is, it, is it the dead or is it the living? Is it the dead or is it the living? If we, if we have put our hope in the perishable things, in the things that will die, is it any wonder that we're not found singing praises? Is it any wonder that we aren't starting our introduction of the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus? Because we're consumed with the perishable things. We're consumed with the things that will die. Our daughter Sarah, she had a, a doctor's visit this week. She had to go to the dentist. And as we were waiting for the dentist, I noticed he had some things in the office there, and I started to look at a few of the things. There was a quote hanging on the wall, and it caught my eye. The quote said this. It says, When I reach the end of my days, a moment or two from now, I must look back on something more meaningful than the pursuits of houses and lands, machines, stocks, and bonds, nor is fame of a lasting benefit. I will consider my earthly existence to have been wasted unless I recall a loving family, a consistent investment in the lives of people, and an earnest attempt to serve the God who made me. He says this, and there's no better time than now to assess the values which are worthy of my time and my effort. I thought that was pretty well written. That's a quote from Dr. James, Job, James Dobson. Many, many of you are familiar with him. But how often do we put our time and effort into the perishable things? How often... Are we focusing on the things that will die? Verse 23 says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. If we change our focus to the in, imperishable, what will live? Souls, right? The Word of God, right? If our focus is on those things, would it be any wonder that our hope would be increased? That the way that we carry ourselves? Not only that, but what's the purpose? Praise God, right? Praising God. We're found praising God on the tip of our tongue. It's no mistake that all of these letters are introduced praising God for what Christ has done. How many times... Are we found opening our conversation that way? How many times is that the thought or the talk that's on the tip of our tongues? Are we consumed with the things that will perish? Consumed with the things that are dead? I think there's a reason for that. Um, I haven't preached against this for a while, so I'll do it this morning. This right here has a lot of perishable things, right? And I am just as guilty. I am just as guilty because you'll see one. And then most things that we look at today, right? Then there's another and another and another and another. Imperishable. Not imperishable. Perishable. These things will die. These things will fade, right? And yet we're consumed with them. We're consumed with them. And not only that, they take up a lot of our time and a lot of our effort. But what lasts forever? The Word of God, right? Here it is. Imperishable. Imperishable. If you're feeling hopeless, or if you're feeling consumed with death, or grief, or trouble, those things are rooted in the things of the world. This is rooted in perishable. And the encouragement is there. Think of the encouragement. I'm going to have you turn back. I jumped around a little bit this morning, but look back. I just love the language of this in verse 4. He talks about this, the resurrection of Christ. That is the only genuine thanksgiving. True hope is found in the resurrection of Christ. And he says this in verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power 
until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. What an encouragement that is, right? If you're only hearing me read that to you on a Sunday morning, then you're missing out on the words of life. Every day, we can turn here and experience the hope. We can experience the imperishable things, the life things of the Word of God that will never end. They will never end. Guess what? Temporary. Right? Temporary. And so that's my second challenge you this morning. Think about how we are investing our time. Is our time invested in the things that will perish or in the things that were imperishable? Look down once again to verse 13. Verse 13 is this call to action. And it's sort of that what does it look like when we experience this hope. Verse 13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. There was a, a boy that grew up not too far from here. And he was raised in a loving childhood in a Christian home, raised in the church, even professing Christ as a young age. But pretty soon, there were social pressures in his life. He began to cave into a sort of a split sort of lifestyle, pursuing the things of this world, experimenting with his friends, introduced to drugs and introduced to alcohol, and soon was living a conflicted life. When he became an adult, he chose the direction of the world. He stepped into the direction of the world. His focus was no longer split. He was completely consumed with the addiction that had started in him. He was completely consumed with himself. He was only worried about his flesh, the things that will die, the things that will perish. That's all his life was about. Pursuit of those things. Pursuit of one thing. What pleases Jeremy? What pleases Jeremy? Yes, that boy was me. I was in pursuit of all of those things of my own desire, what I thought could fill me, what I thought could please me, and none of it could. Recently, Psalm 32, I, I mentioned this, it was a challenge to my youth group students. I said, Psalms are so beautiful, and there are so many different Psalms written to so many different things that often people will find a Psalm, you know, that, and they might call it their life Psalm. If there's any life Psalm for me, it's Psalm 32. And there's a section and it says, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. I will never forget it that moment when I hit my knees and confessed my sin. That moment coming out of years, years of addiction, years of a, of, of a pursuit of the things that will die and the things that cannot satisfy. And I can tell you that I've experienced what Peter is talking about. That forgiveness leads to, he says it this way, an inexpressible joy. I think that's such a great way to put it. It really is because, man, I felt the call to, to preach the gospel. I felt the call to tell other people about Christ, to tell other people my story, and I can't express it. I, I don't feel like it's done adequately enough. Does that make sense? Because only having experienced what that forgiveness feels like, only having understood the grace that we receive upon our faith in Christ, it's just... Do you agree with that? It's just a hard thing to describe. But this is what I fear. I fear that as a result of that, many of us 
have just chosen to not tell our story or out of convenience or maybe out of social pressure. I didn't really mention that, but you know, the suffering and the difficulty that these folks were dealing with during this time in the context of the letter was likely a social pressure. Jews that weren't messianic, Jews that haven't professed Christ, persecuting the Jews that had, or living, you know, with that Greek surrounding and having the influence of social pressure, right? They were living in the world, right? As Christians, we're to be set apart from that. We're to step away from that. The passage says, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. It's the third point that I wanted to make to you this morning. If you're sitting here thinking, like, I just got hope. It's not as genuine or it's lacking something. Examine your own heart. Is there something that is not pleasing to the Lord? Is there something that does not line up with a life that is lived in the Spirit? Because that will absolutely stand in the way of that joy. That will absolutely stand in the way of the peace that we have. And it will absolutely stand in the way of us praising the Lord. It's what we were made to do. It's what we were made to do. So I want you to think about that this morning. We did an exercise in youth group last Wednesday because of Thanksgiving. And we just took a moment and said, there's a whiteboard. If something comes to your mind, just step up there and write what you're thankful for. So in a group of 6th to 12th graders, you can imagine, perhaps, what that list might look like. There were a lot of good things on there, right? Many, many good things. There were some solid things, right? You know, even just the name of Jesus, it took quite a while before that was written on the board. I want you to think about that. The genuine thanks that we have is solely rooted in that. If someone says to you, what are you most thankful for? That's an easy answer. For the following believer in Jesus Christ, that is an easy answer. The question is, is it on the tip of your tongue? Is it the beginning of your conversation? Is it the end of your conversation? You may be dealing with difficulty. You may be dealing with a trial or suffering. I encourage you this morning, know this, that is temporary. That is temporary. Not only that, God is using that to reveal your faith, to refine your faith, right? Not to prove your faith. Don't be consumed with the the perishable things. Don't be consumed with what is dead. You know, Dobson said that. He said, maybe now. No, he didn't say that. He said, now there is no better time to assess the values which are worthy of my effort. And perhaps that's something you need to look at. Are we consumed with the perishable or the imperishable? Are we consumed with the things that are dying or the things that will live forever? And finally, that challenge from Peter, prepare your minds for action. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. There's an issue of sin in your life that will stand directly in the way of this joy and hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Be willing to open your mouth. Be willing to confess it. Be willing to go to God with that. The grace that you experience in that place, the forgiveness that you experience in that place is inexpressible. Inexpressible joy that we have when we're close to God. He ends the chapter, he's quoting from Isaiah. All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for an encouragement that we find in Peter, but Lord, a reminder that our hope would be found only in you. God, I pray for each person here today. I don't know the different situations, but you do. I don't know the different struggles or griefs or things they may be going through. God, help us to have an understanding, to 
this is temporary. Lord, help us to see the ways that you're refining and building our faith. And then return us to praise to you. Lord, keep from us these things that will not matter in the end. Lord, if it's, if it's something that's just keeping us with the perishable, Lord, things that will have no meaning, Lord, help us to turn from them and focus on the things that have, have eternal. Lord, things that will not die. Lord, to focus on relationships, our love of one another, to focus on the hope that we found in Christ. And Lord, if there is sin in our lives, help us, Lord, to turn from those things, to take an honest look, for, to examine our hearts, God, anything that stands in the way. Lord, would you help us to confess and turn back to you? In the name of Jesus, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 600.